Welcome to Best Kept Secrets Travel, Episode 9. My name's Morgan. And I'm Will. And on today's episode, we're doing a deep dive into Indonesia. Best friends and that's for life. Who stay traveling? I'm talking worldwide. 65 countries between the two. Every moment is so unbelievable. Sharing the best kept secrets about the trips and mistakes they made that they can't forget. So tell me if you're ready for a time to remember as they gear up for the next adventure. Yeah. Woo! Best kept secrets travel. Before Morgan kicks us off with the location and geography of Indonesia, I just need to tell you guys who are listening and watching us, the best way to support us is to like, subscribe, comment, ring that notification bell, or to try and send this to one of your friends if you've learned something new today and to push it to anyone that you know because it massively helps us as that's gonna help us grow so we can tell more people. Indonesia is a country located off mainland Southeast Asia near the Pacific and Indian Oceans. It is an archipelago that lies across the equator and spans a distance equivalent of one eighth of the world's circumference. Little bit of history of Indonesia as first people arrived 40,000 years ago and in the 16th century, the Portuguese arrived to export lots of spices to Europe as they were selling at very high prices. They took spices such as nutmeg, cinnamon, ginger, cloves and mace. They lost their position to the Dutch in the 17th century in exporting these prices as they were selling across Europe faster than ever before. The Dutch then recognised Indonesia's independence in 1949 under UN pressure. The capital of Indonesia is Jakarta, which is based on the northwestern coast of the island of Java. Indonesia was fourth most populous country in the world, with a population of 270.6 million. So Morgan, if you're travelling from Britain, what kind of vaccines or visas would you need to travel to Indonesia? So under normal circumstances, for up to 30 days, British passport holders do not need a visa. And in some areas in Indonesia, there is a malaria risk, so make sure to do your own research and check that your vaccines are up to date. The best time to visit Indonesia is between May and September because this is the dry season. Although I tend to avoid July and August because that's when it's really busy and really touristy and the prices are often hiked at that time of year. If you guys are looking to go surfing in Indonesia, the best time is between April and October and the swells are a lot better on the east coast between November and March. If you're looking for a little bit more specific surfing then you go into the Isle of Sumatra, and the best surfing is between June and July because you get a very consistent swell and the weather is perfect. One pound is the equivalent of 20,155 Indonesian rupiah. When you're trying to access money from ATMs or any bank, make sure you use recognized banks or look up online the most certified banks in the country and stick with them instead of trying to use any ATMs around convenience stores just to minimize your chance of potentially putting yourself in a situation of being mugged or someone taking some of your card details. And if you want to do a big transaction, it's very good to go to the bank. And the plugs that they use in Indonesia are type C and type F, which are the two round holes. If you're watching us on YouTube right now, these are the plugs we mean. Ta -da! When you're in Indonesia, it really won't be too hard to find people who speak English. It's a massive tourist destination for everyone who's trying to find themselves. Also, westernized films are huge in parts of Asia as well. That's where a lot of locals will learn their English from. The official language in Indonesia is Bahasa, and there are over 300 different local languages and 500 different dialects. So right now, we're going to try and practice some Indonesian, and Will doesn't know what any of these mean. And please don't slaughter Morgan for his pronunciation of these. Or Will's when he tries it as well. Uh, so the first one is Sakan, so that's S-A-K-A-N. Just starting off early, Let, let's go for the first thing, Let, let it's going to be hi or something. Yes, it's hello. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the next one is Aku Sintakanu. Say that again. Aku Sintakanu. Sintak Kamu. Aku Sinta Kamu. Oh, I did a poo. You got you, you you actually you actually got one word right, which is I. Oh, nailed it. <laughs> uh, it's I love you. Oh. Uh, the next one is Mafkan Saya. The Mafia is coming. Mafkan Saya. It is not the Mafia is coming. 
it is I'm sorry. It's a very British phrase that we use a lot, and I think it's very important that everyone knows how to say it. It can get you out of a few places. <laughs> yeah. The next one is permisi. Permisi. Mm. Sounds like permission. Permisi. Excuse me. Excuse me. It, it is excuse me. Oh, damn. Doing well. Uh, Tarima Kasi. So that's Tarima. T E R I M A. Kasi. K A S I H. By the way, everyone, I do have the spelling of these, but I don't have the, the English for them. Sounds like a dish. Not a clue. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> You're slightly off with that one. The next one is the mana toilet. And I'm sure toilet isn't... <laughs> Where is the toilet? <laughs> yeah, another very important phrase that I think is I often need and I think everyone needs and I find very useful when I'm traveling to know what that is in the local dialect. It helps. Yeah. Unless you start just doing charades. The next one is Namasaya. What would your charade be for where's the bathroom? I. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the next one is Namasaya. Namasaya. See, that always sounds like Namaste. I don't know, is it? Namasaya. The way Namasaya. Well, it sounds like you could, like, trying to say, like, have a good day or, like, something. It actually almost something. sounds like the English word. It's one of the word. What is it? So the phrase I would say is Namasaya Morgan. My name is Morgan. Yes. Ah. Uh, the next one is Sire Ingin Minum Beer. That's got to be something to do with beer. This <laughs> <laughs> so is beer spelled B I R. Yeah. So it could be Burr. <laughs> could be Burr. I'm not sure actually. If there's anyone who knows the pronunciation of any of these that we've got totally wrong, if you wouldn't mind phonetically spelling them in the comments, that'd be quite helpful for us. <laughs> Um, I'd like a beer. I want to drink a beer. Oh, of course. Of course. The next one is too long or too long. We're really doing that, Morgan. Yeah, oh, too long. Yeah, you haven't scribbled out, please, for me. Oh, it's, 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 or, it's, or, or nice to meet you. It's please. Okay. Do you want to try the next one? The pronunciation. Senang. <laughs> Temu Danangu Danangmu Yeah, my guess would be Senang but Temu Dengang Deng Deng Do you want to say that? So much confidence Deng Deng to slaughter it. <laughs> so that one means nice to meet you. Now this this next one I also want you to give a go, and then I'll tell you what it means afterwards. <laughs> This one? Yeah, the, the, the yeah. Including the question mark. Kamu Kelihatan Pukat Baik Baik Saja? Yeah, my, my guess would be Kamu Kelihatan Pukat Baik Baik Saja. Or it could be Saya. I don't know. Not a clue. Not a clue. So, any guesses to what that is? I own a Pui cat. Help, help. Kill it. <laughs> uh, so it's you look pale. Are you okay? Okay. <laughs> Back to a slightly bit more seriousness of the episode is when you're packing for your trip to Indonesia. Is what what do you pack? What do you pack if you're popping over to Indonesia on a trip? So for Indonesia, I know it's a lot more laid back than it would be for dressing up to say London, for example. Yeah. Plus, it's a lot warmer. So. For me personally, it'd be a lot of sun cream, definitely some Imodium. Um, if you're doing more specific tricks, hiking, it'll be specific hiking gear, like hiking poles and maybe hiking shoes and yep. things like that. Um, but in general, I'd say it's much more laid back, casual wear, beach wear, swim wear. Or if you're going over for a specific excursion or a specific sport, you know, you might, you might have packed your surfboard you might have bought your wetsuit probably won't need a wetsuit snorkel you, yeah you might have bought 
you know, I've taken my snorkel to Indonesia. I've taken my dive watch because I've been mm-hmm. doing diving. But when I was learning my paddy, and I, I did my main paddy certification in the UK, but then mm-hmm. I did my advanced diving in in Indonesia. Mm-hmm. That's when I then took out. I got a dive watch. Which where where in Indonesia? Which island did you go from? If you can remember, there are only about eighteen thousand islands. I can't remember. Can't remember. I, I've I've gone to Sumba Island. I've gone to a few other islands. Um, Another important thing that I always think when researching to go to a different country is to actually look up what some of their local foods are and local drinks because I think it's always good fun to try and experience some of their culture and try lots of different drinks and food and of course obviously try the local beer of course you've got to try the local beer so local beer in Indonesia is Bintang I highly recommend it it's seriously seriously good for the keen beer drinkers out there I would say it's a session is a session lager and I think they also have a clothing brand in that you can get Bintang tank tops <laughs> oh, you, can, you can get them on every street corner <laughs> one of the main things which I recommend to anyone who does go out to Indonesia is don't just try and do the super touristy things make sure that you're also going and doing the really fun slightly different things I highly recommend anyone if you're on a gap year or if you're going at any age is try and have as many cooking lessons as you can it's completely different cuisine to anywhere I've ever been in the world I've probably had five cooking lessons in Indonesia and every time I've learned something new why is such a bad cook you've only had five <laughs> their main dishes are things such as nasi goreng or mee goreng nasi goreng and mee goreng are very similar someone out there is going to slaughter me for saying that the biggest difference to me from exterior perspective is Nasi goreng uses rice, mi goreng uses noodles. Typically, they try and use as much leftover rice or noodle from previous nights and as much leftover meat, fish, or anything else, but mm-hmm. you can just add that at the, at the end anyway. Who is, who is your favorite egg fried rice <laughs> uh, creator? He is Malaysian, but he's super funny, and we both watch him, his uncle Roger on YouTube. He does egg fried rice, but there is certain episodes where he does look at nasi goreng. I was about to say that they're similar to nasi. They're not similar. Um, but there's similarities. And I believe when he reviewed Gordon Ramsay, mm. that that was Gordon cooking a nasi goreng. Yes. And he's left over right and he was in Indonesia. But it's super lovely food. If you're on your gap here and about to go to university, Learning the basics of cooking proper noodles, proper rice, make a huge difference to your experience as well. And they're super fun, super tasty dishes. I've also learned pad thai. One of the favorite things out there as well, super easy to cook once you know how to do it, is chicken satay. So it's a very basic barbecued chicken skewer, and then you make a lovely peanut sauce to go with it. If you're not a massive fan or you're allergic to peanuts, there are other alternatives you can do. For street food, there's CMA, which is essentially the Indonesian version of dim sum. And they sell them on all the different street vendors. And that's well worth a try. How are we going to pronounce this word? Should we try and say it at the same time? Three, two, one. Tebulawak. So neither of Morgan and I know how to pronounce this drink, but it's made using Java ginger. It was Indonesia's very own carbonated soft drink. drink from the 1980s it's meant to be very lovely funny enough i actually didn't try when i was out there i didn't really know about it until we've come back and we've deep dived into it and it also is meant to have anti-inflammatory properties which is meant to be really healthy huge benefits of ginger out there it's not just anti-inflammatory properties morgan it's also an anti-diuretic so morgan no longer needs to carry around emodium if he's going around indonesia he can just drink buy loads of drinks Temulawak or Temulawak however you want to pronounce it one of us is saying it wrong potentially both of us are saying it wrong (laughs) but Morgan no longer needs Imodium whilst he's out there Imodium Morgan's favourite food need to get sponsored (laughs) could you imagine just like (laughs) for travelling to Indonesia there are two main airports the first one is in Jakarta and the second main airport is in Bali as well as Morgan telling you about these airports, I'm also going to tell you that Indonesia has one of the worst flight records in the world. When you're traveling to or from an airport, I highly recommend that you make sure that you've either pre-booked a taxi, or you've certified taxi, or if you're in a hostel or a hotel when you're out there, 
ask if they know any really good taxi drivers. I've got a friend who travel around most of Indonesia and the taxi driver actually followed him around the whole island. And on one day he phoned him up saying, I'm ill, so I'm sending my brother or cousin. And he turned up and he said it was super cheap the whole way along. I think this is a very common thing around um, Asia in general because this is the same thing that I had in India where instead of getting the bus, we hired a taxi driver who basically stayed with us for three days. but it's similar in that you have your friend. Yeah, and it can be very, very cheap. Just make sure that you trust them or you've been recommended them by someone else. Yeah, makes sense. <clears throat> On the note of traveling around in Indonesia, sadly, I just got put out there that be very careful when you're looking at hiring or driving around on a moped or a motorbike. Yes, you will see eight-year-olds, six-year-olds driving motorbikes with half their family on the back with 10 cows, 89 chickens, and 59 barrels of oil. But these are people who have grown up in that situation. These are people who don't have the same the same safety record that we have in Western civilization. And sadly, there are a lot of accidents on the road. Even when I've been yeah. out there, I've been in a hotel and... One day I was out fishing. I then found out that the deck mate on the boat had then got hit by a car on his moped and died. We're not trying to scare people from going out and having a lot of fun. We just want to precaution a lot of these aspects because you just need to think about these when you're taking different steps and you need to weigh up the risk versus the reward on everything that you do. Cost benefit analysis. Cost benefit analysis with Morgan Savile, the traveling accountant. Very quick breakdown of costs whilst you're out in Indonesia is that average beer is going to cost you 35,000 rupiah. Don't get too scared, that's only £1.75. And you can easily live on £20 a day, but if you're going on a real shoestring budget, you can go down to £10 a day. Just remember that this isn't taking into account certain excursions which can easily jump up your price because if you're going skydiving or if you're going out and you're doing your paddy certification course, then a lot of these things won't be included in mm -hmm. that price. But some trips that you can book will be, for example, a surfing holiday for a week and everything will be included in certain packages. And for accommodation, you can book hostels for as low as £4 a night, which is ridiculously cheap and means you can spend more money on bintang. And if you're willing to cook for yourself and you don't mind being slightly more isolated from certain people, there are unbelievable options on Airbnb whilst you're traveling in Indonesia. I've seen people renting humongous multiple bedroom houses in Bali. In Bali. Overlooking the whole rainforest. Super, super cheap. And the second you start bringing more people along with you, the cheaper it's just going to get. Yeah. The best way to get around Indonesia, because there's lots of islands, is by flight. There are lots of seaplanes and boats that can actually help you get around all the different islands. If you're looking for a slightly riskier, more adventurous, potentially you're a solo traveler and you're really willing to risk it and you want to really deep dive into being a local. And it's might... a cultural experience as well. It is huge cultural experience. It's called a BMO or a BEMO. Someone's going to tell us our pronunciation is wrong. Sorry, our pronunciation. I was about to correct you on that. <laughs> is wrong. It is effectively getting in the back of a lorry or a pickup truck. Mm -hmm. You're going to be sat there for multiple hours. You're going to have 10, 20, 30 chickens, maybe a few sheep, maybe a couple of cows. You don't know what's in there with you. You could have another 16 people with you, majority of them kids. And then you're going to spend the whole journey with a grandma and actually trying to offer you an orange. And what normally happens with these BMO rides or BMO, well, I'm going BMO rides, is there isn't a proper schedule. They have a rough schedule, but they tend to only go off when the actual BMO is full. And some of these rides as well will also act as a storefront. So you might just stop at a random time and wonder why have we suddenly stopped 10 minutes after being picked up. And then you're going to be stuck there for the next half an hour because they drop down the back and actually they're just selling loads of fruit and veg out the back. And then they carry on because that's another way that they make money on the journey. So when you're going anything truly local in Indonesia, just remember that time is not time. Time is completely based around whoever's driving that vehicle. Cool. Time is money. Money is time. Course benefit analysis. Now for some quick fire facts about Indonesia. Let me Random fact time, Morgan. Ow! With over 17,500 islands, 6,000 of them inhabited, and over 100 active volcanoes, 
and over a hundred critically endangered animals, Indonesia is full of amazing things. Indonesia also has the world's largest lava lake. And in Sumatra in the jungle, there are still over 40 uncontacted tribes. The largest flower in the world is Rafflesia arnolbia, also known as the corpse lily, due to its foul odour when it's blooming. And it weighs up to 7 kilos. And if any of you guys out there are also Pokemon nerds, this flower was the inspiration for Vileplume. Indonesia also has the same flag as Monaco, and they broke the world record for the largest packet of instant noodles, of mee goreng instant noodles. Can you guess how big it is? 50 kilos. So it was 66 kilos, and it was 3.4 meters by 2.3 meters, and 47 centi- by 47 centimeters. So it was very large. You're going to need a fair few university students to jump through that. And it was completely edible as well. Perfect. 66 kilos of instant <laughs> noodles. I wonder how much water you need. How big a cup you need to actually cook that? <laughs> That's a lot. I wonder if they actually ate it. Or if they just kept it as a like symbol. I feel like they must have attempted to eat it. I kind of want to know now. Other than Iceland, Indonesia is the only other place in the world that you can see blue lava, otherwise known as blue fire. This is due to the chemical composition around the volcano which is the high density of sulfur leaking into the air around the lava, which combusts really quickly around the lava, just anywhere above 360 degrees, I believe. And then it creates this unbelievable blue flame and it's like nothing you've ever seen before. And you can see it in the Ijen region. The spelling is on the screen now for anyone viewing because I've probably said it wrong. I-J-E-N. It's it's tough spelling. The Aijun Volcano Complex also has the world's largest acid lakes Ooh. with an average pH of zero. That's, that's very acidic. That's crazy acidic. Yeah. But that's where I believe all the sulfur's leaking into and then it's also pushing over to lava to make it blue. So this would definitely be one of our best kept secrets as to where you should go in Indonesia. It's a less known thing to go and do, which makes it all that much more exciting because Indonesia does gain a huge tourist population. And sometimes you want to do the things which are going to draw you away from the crowd and you feel like it's a lot more of a special moment for you. And it's a very unique thing to see. Oh, it's an amazingly unique thing to see. And it's a lot more accessible to see it in Indonesia than it is in Iceland. Morgan and I are now going to blitz through lots of different excursions, locations and different activities that you guys can do whilst you're in Indonesia. This is also a great time for me to remind you guys, please like, subscribe, comment below, leave us a review on whatever platform you're listening or watching us on because this massively helps us. So please scroll down, tiny little click, and then you've subscribed to our channel and you guys will get more information in the future. To kick us off, Morgan's going to talk about... So you can visit the home of the Flores Man, the Homo Florensians, do you want to try to say this word? The Homo Florensiensis. Is that, is that what we're going to go for? We're going to go for that. We're going to go for it. The Homo, Flor- <laughs> the Homo Florensiensis were a small type of human who dates back 12,000 years. The Liangbua Cave at the Flores was a discovery site in 2003. Nothing you might fancy doing whilst you're in Indonesia is going and visiting two UNESCO sites in the same day. If you wake up very early, like I did whilst I was, I believe I was 13 years old, I woke up about 3.30 in the morning being told you're going to have the most amazing sunrise you've seen in your life, whilst actually being at the world's largest Buddhist temple known as Borobudur. Turned up super early, hiked up, little telling of what about the temple and the stories, the main stories along the walls of the temple. Got to the top, sun's rising, cloud absolutely everywhere and could not see a thing i'm really trying to think now i don't think i've been at any tourist site for sunrise where it hasn't been really cloudy if i went back now i'd probably appreciate the temple a lot more than i did when i was that young being told i'm being woken up super early to be around a temple but if you're 13 and going to indonesia watch this video and you'll learn and appreciate a lot more about all these different temples i hope so whilst you're at Borobudur, 
please do take the time to walk around and really appreciate it. It's been there for such a long time and it is a UNESCO site for a reason. It is a significant mm-hmm. site in our world and especially to a religion which you, some of you guys might not be that sort of aware of and I might want to learn a bit more about. The second UNESCO site really close to Borobudur is Prambanan. This is an amazing Hindu temple. It actually isn't just one temple. It consists of 240 temple structures with a central piece standing at 47 meters tall. Highly recommend you going. It's an eighth century temple, which is still standing wow. today. The fact that there's so many parts of the structure which are still perfectly standing. Yes, a lot of it is sort of in ruin, but they've tried to preserve as much as possible. Mm-hmm. Is a feat of its own. It is just you don't understand the scale of it just from a physical size but also how long it must have taken the detail the craftsmanship on the walls when you're in any of these countries it's just absolutely immaculate that they're doing into this stone and into this rock it's just it's just unbelievable talking about religion another quick fact about indonesia is that indonesia actually has the world's largest muslim population i didn't really realize that until i'd done my deep research into indonesia for the deep. I think that could surprise a lot of our listeners and our viewers today. Mm. You can discover a colour-changing lake in the Dieng Plateau, which is a national park that's home to a glistening lake, which is very impressive to go and see. It's got this really deep sort of blue colour and almost haziness when you look at it, but at the same time, it's just perfectly crystal clear. Yeah, and I definitely recommend visiting it for sunrise because that is when it's at its most beautiful because it's got the sun glistening off it and there are amazing heights that you can do in the area as well Mm. if any of our viewers or listeners are super passionate about wildlife like i am then one of the most amazing things you can do is go and meet a real dragon like the ones in game of thrones exactly like the ones in game of thrones but these ones weigh up to 90 kilos 2.6 meters long and can run just over 20 kilometers an hour Wow. That and poison, and normal people, what's that miles per hour? Which is roughly 12.5 miles per hour for anyone who does it in miles per hour. They're not just fast, they're not just large, but they do also have a poison. So these are just dangerous creatures. They're, they're as close as I personally just think of like sort of dinosaur, which is still walking the earth. It's a bit like when you see a crocodile or alligator. They just have something mysterious about them and you know they've just been around for so long. I'm disappointed it's uh, a poison, not fire though. So that would be cool. Yeah, but a poisonous dragon versus a fire dragon, you know, very different, very different. Another thing you can experience is a day of pitch black silence. The Niepi Festival takes place in March on the island of Bali. It is a day of silence, so even the airport closes and you're not allowed to go outside or show any sort of lights. The night before is magical. Everyone goes crazy with loud lights. Loud lights, that's the thing. With lights, loud noises, crazy with drums, fire, flames, and scares off all the evil spirits. The next day is when they realise it's silent and there are no spirits, so they've got to be quiet for the rest of the day. And this is a very unique experience and I think probably best to do when you're hungover and you just want to close your eyes and lie down for the day. (laughs) (laughs) It's not just Komodo dragons that you can find in Indonesia. They've actually got rhinos and tigers that you guys might not know about. In Indonesia, they have the Sumatran white rhinoceros, which is the smallest living rhinoceros. They believe there are less than 80 left crossing the border between Sumatra into Borneo. Mm -hmm. They're the only Asian rhinoceros which have two horns. Oh, interesting. And we need to protect them at all costs, but sadly their numbers are really struggling because I believe that only... In the past 15 years, only two of the females have given birth, which is just terrifying stats. And sadly, we are probably going to see the numbers deplete, especially as there's more deforestation and poaching still going on. Mm -hmm. But the activists out there, the foundations out there are trying to really push this. And so is the government now. They're trying to crack down. As well as this rhinoceros, you have the Sumatran tiger, which is also the smallest living tiger out there. But it's really, really particularly dark black stripes Mm -hmm. against their orange and they're that much smaller which makes them that much more unique so everything except their dragons and their instant noodles are very small in indonesia is essentially what you're saying 
yeah they've got some small animals out there but that's the thing is you know just like you Morgan you have to put up with small things in your life but sadly with the Tigers there are only 400 left they think the numbers are slight they're not quite sure where the numbers going in direction but the biggest thing happening right now is this continual deforestation and poaching of the Tigers is still drastically going on because of the beliefs of the medicines and everything out there because there are certain islands in Indonesia which still practicing headhunting and sorcery and different blood rituals I mean why wouldn't you practice sorcery because maybe you just like ketchup and barbecue sauce that, that's almost funny I'll, I'll almost give you that <laughs> if you're a fan of dogs otherwise known as doggos thin boys thick boys with two C's then you guys might want to make a donation or help out any of the foundations in Indonesia with the barley dog the barley dog if you haven't heard of it is known as one of the purest breeds of dogs in the world it's also believed to be potentially the oldest breed of dog in the whole world not just the oh. purest they believe there's a chance that it is also one of the oldest or the oldest breeds of dogs in the world mm, it does wow. come in many colors it's not just one singular color or pattern dog but it's just this you see it everywhere and really sadly there are government approved culling still going on because of the laws and red tape around it that they believe they have a higher rate of rabies and just because the numbers are quite high but there are foundations out there which are trying to save as many of them as they can and by you guys donating to those foundations or trying to find trips where they might support those foundations you guys can make a serious difference to these little logos so we will put some links into the description as to some of these foundations so you can do your own research and have a look at it for yourself so as well as when you scroll down slightly there's a subscribe button so you need to click that and that's going to unlock the button which click the arrow <laughs> and in the description below there is going to be a link to a foundation those. which we we're going to research foundation for you guys to potentially donate to so that you can help the serious dog in need one of the more touristy locations you can go to is tanalot which if you can get there and you can enjoy it to yourself so this would be at sunrise it sounds like an essex sunbed <laughs> hi welcome to tanalot it could be um, if you can go there for sunrise you might be lucky enough to go there and there's not many people but this is one of those overly touristy places where it's just packed by other human beings it's kind of far out and it's essentially a temple on a rock this is one of those very popular destinations that you may try and go to and there'll be lots of pictures that you want to try and get but there'll be lots of other humans in the way so it's probably not one of our favorite places to talk about or go to but it's worth going to if you can get there without humans it's something we thought we should bring to your guys attention as some people just want to go and do these main slightly touristy things just like if you're going to new york you need to see the statue of liberty is it going to be what you expected probably not but there are certain things i think that you have to tick off whenever you travel to certain countries just say mm. that we've done it and this is def this is one of those that some of you guys viewing or listening might actually want to go and do but as we are best kept secrets travel we want to try and push you guys into the more unique and less touristy destinations exactly i think one of the best things i've ever done in my life is lying in water holding onto a surfboard or not meet me <laughs> I think one of the best things I've ever done in my life is lying in the water, pitch black, holding the end of a surfboard. So at night? Yeah. Light attached to the bottom of the surfboard, beaming down. So over time, it attracts all the different bits. So it attracts the tiny little plankton and everything first. And then all of a sudden, maybe half an hour later, out of nowhere, just this shadow appears. And then you realize that it's this massive manta ray oh wow and then they come in and what they do is they do a backflip roll to come up and they're maybe a foot away from you to try and eat all the plankton and all the krill and everything that's turned up and there's just nothing like it just lying there in the ocean at night just wondering what the hell's going to turn up you see a few fish and all of a sudden loads of these manta rays just turn up mm -hmm. out there so when you're near one of the islands of komodo this is something that you can do and look it up online find the different activity centers that offer this but if you can really do experience when you're also scuba diving in indonesia there are lots of different feeding stations and cleaning stations for the manta rays as well mm -hmm. which you can go and dive out i believe when i was doing my paddy advanced diving in indonesia yeah one of the 
cleaning station I went to, I think we counted 65 manta rays oh, wow. within one dive. We went down, just sat there at the bottom, held onto a rock and just watched them coming down. And it was like shark tails, whale car wash. You just, it was so funny. Yeah. There was one tiny black tip, black tip reef shark in the background, just going back and forth, just almost watching all the tiny fish. And then one after another, it was just like a normal car wash, just mm -hmm. manta ray comes in, comes out, all these tiny fish go onto it. Yeah. And then it just slowly leaves away. Oh, that's amazing. And it's just, yeah, it's one of the most bizarre, but amazing things that you've seen within nature. Would you say Indonesia is a good place to learn how to dive? I think Indonesia is probably, out of everywhere I've ever scuba dived in my life, number one favorite place. Really? I think the water clarity, the water temperature, the wildlife that you can see on reefs when you're fairly shallow diving, mm -hmm. so anywhere, I call a shallow dive anywhere sub 15 meters. Some of my favorite dives in Indonesia have been done at between sort of eight to 10 meters going across a reef and you just see everything. Mm. When you're only a few meters deep, you can see lionfish, turtles, every, just unbelievable place to go and learn to dive. And if you haven't dived before, if you're nervous about diving, I do really recommend yeah. Indonesia because the seas aren't often as rough and it's just such a lovely feeling. And if you're worried about getting in a wetsuit, quite often you don't need to wear a wetsuit with an Indonesian diving. So I've mm -hmm. done a lot of my diving in Indonesia just wearing board shorts. Oh, fantastic it's seriously seriously good an experience that i very much enjoy doing when i visit lots of different countries is sort of try and do some of their traditional crafts and try and learn about how to make it or build it or even watch them one of the things that you can do in indonesia is take part in a workshop for traditional crafts kota gede is that how we're going to say it kota gied kota gede Kota Gede is a district in Yogyakarta which is famous for its silver factories and you can go and do one of these workshops and you can try and actually make some of these which I think is a really exciting thing to do. Just like a lot of the Asian countries, Indonesia specifically just has this amazing tradition of handcraft mm. anything so yeah. I know I've got, if you give me two seconds, here we have an amazing wooden hand carved Dewi Shri, if I've mispronounced, it's written here, unless I've mispronunciated that. Okay. She, what, what, how is it spelled? D E W I I S R I. She is the goddess of rice and fertility to the Balinese, Sudanese, and Javanese mm -hmm. in the pre Islamic and pre Hindu era and still widely worship today across lots of indonesia as you can see so i'll bring her forward so i thought that was a really cool item so where did you get it how did you get it so we bought her as a group of different um carved sculptures mm -hmm. by a local artist in bali and then when we bought them as multiple there was a lot of haggling to be done. Ooh. And if you want to see our episode on haggling, I believe that's episode five Sounds in the series. Tea. Next up, we have one of the most popular drinks in the world is tea. Coffee. <laughs> <laughs> when you're traveling to Indonesia or if you're just looking up coffee online, you might come across something as Kopi Lawak. This is, if you don't know already, it is when coffee beans have been harvested mm -hmm. from the excrement, otherwise known as poop, from poop. the civet. A civet is a cat slash possum like creature, really lovely creatures. But what they do is that when they go out and they're looking food, they'll go and get a load of coffee beans and then they poop out the cherries of the beans and then these are harvested, cleaned off, and then turned into coffee. They believe that somehow, somewhere, this helps the coffee flavor. But what's sadly happening now is just due to the sheer demand and the unbelievable driven by the price of this product which is stupidly expensive so it's one of the most expensive coffees in the world yeah and the really sad thing like everything is second money just gets ridiculous mm -hmm. and people take advantage of this they're now force feeding a lot of these civets and putting them through quite a lot of pain and making them eat far more than they should in their lifetime mm -hmm. so if you're looking at it please only do buy really specific animal friendly products and if not you know just don't buy it at all 
<laughs> yeah, so that's probably an easier option. Um, isn't it? There are a lot of cheaper options out there, and some of those cheaper options, at least we know they're directly supporting really good communities. A very famous location for tourists in Bali is Pura Lempang. Pura Lempuyang otherwise known as the gates of heaven and this is very famous for this famous photo which is this but what people don't tend to know is that you end up queuing for hours because lots of people go to this specific temple just for this specific photo and it's actually a little man or woman a human standing there with a mirror and basically they have the mirror and that reflects so you can get this perfect image I personally would still go there to get this image because it is a very famous image and I like photography but there is a huge line and you have to bear in mind that this is one of those overly touristy locations which could ruin the magic and what people don't tend to realize is that there are actually seven different temples around this area and you can walk around them and it takes about four hours and they all have different beautiful views and a very interesting but people go just for this photo, which I still, as I said, I still would. Go. I know when Jacob was there not that long ago because he holds a lot of workshops. I know that I saw one of his photos there and he'd done a lot of editing to it. And often with these photos, you're actually going to have to either just accept or remove people being in the photo with you. Yeah, mm -hmm. there will be a queue for people to get through and sometimes take the photo and they'll remove everyone out of it. But a lot of these amazing locations, if they are super touristy destinations, then... Mm -hmm it's quite hard to avoid people being in your photo. Yeah, so I wouldn't put you off going there, but I would just take it with a grain of salt that there will be very touristy and lots of people there, and it's not going to be as magical as it looks in the photos. If you really want to witness, climb up, part of, or just watch the sunrise or sunset over it, the most amazing volcano in Indonesia is called Mount Bromo. It's in tiny Bro. part of... Bromo? What a carpio? Carpio. Have you seen like... Bromo? <laughs> You're carpio. There's Mount Bromo. It's not the highest volcano in Indonesia, but it just has the most amazing setting and landscape connected mm -hmm. to it. So any sunrise or sunset perfectly hits against it. Yeah. Should be on an Indonesia bucket list. Final amazing thing that I know that you guys can do in Indonesia is actually fishing. I know that fishing isn't for everyone, but Indonesia for me has a massive place in my heart. And I've kept this till last because it is one of my biggest and most fond memories of the country. It was the first time I ever caught what I'd call a significant fish. It was a wahoo, which is one of the fastest fish in the ocean. And I was 12 years old at the time. And it's just over 15 kilos. And for the next sort of three to four days, every single meal I was eating sashimi. And it's just one of the fondest memories. And if you guys have young kids, if you're just keen to try something new or you're massive on fishing, Indonesia does have some immaculate fishing. You can also do traditional hand line fishing there, which I've done a lot of when I've been out there, is where you're sat on the boat, you don't have a rod or anything. You're just literally, you can have a beer in one hand and then the other hand, you're just holding a line, jigging it up and down and you can catch all kinds of fish. But I do really recommend actually going out and trying different things and try and get involved in the local yeah. community. So the hand line fishing, you're often supporting lots of locals and if you don't want to eat certain fish there you can just say to the captain instead of throwing it back would you take this to your family and almost always they'll say yes they'll take it to their family or give it to someone in their local community so to summarize our best kept secrets for indonesia is actually going there for their rare wildlife and safaris which is not something that people first think of when they think about indonesia and our next best kept secret that we mentioned before is also the blue lava because it's one of two places in the world that you can see it and this is the easier location to see it in if you're flying over from places such as europe or the us we really recommend that you make sure that you do have a significant period of time in Indonesia. At least but a week, I'd say. I'd say a minimum of a week there because then, you know, your flights, let's say they're realistically going to take up day and a half to two days of that section of your holiday. So if you went from Friday evening to the far following Sunday, you might just get away with a fair bit. It means that you can go over, you could potentially do one of the Gilly Island hopping trips. You could do other island hopping trips. You could go over and appreciate the surfing for a week. You could go and do a yoga retreat for a week there are so many different options out there but really try and expand your time you guys might just go oh i'm going to bali and remember there is actually as we've spoken a lot more in indonesia than just bali please don't stereotype 
when we talk about Indonesia to just one specific area because as we said there are over 17,500 islands yet if you ever say Indonesia to someone they always Bali. just say Bali to you and if you guys get anything just remember Bali is not a country yeah Bali is not a country Instagram is going to show you one side of it and it's going to show you the stereotypical things and a lot of it can be photoshopped edited and filters but there's so much just such an amazing country there's this mm -hmm. wildlife there's this fishing there's the hiking there's the surfing there's the yoga there's blue lava it's one of two countries in the world to see blue lava yeah a lot of people are just spending their time queuing up in random destinations there's so many things and these are the world's it, largest flower world's largest lava lake massive amounts of different ethnic languages it's there is so much to indonesia going to cooking there's just so much just such a beautiful amazing country and it it honestly does irritate me when someone says instead of the actual country they just say bali in bali i know some people viewing or listening is going to get irritated by this because they're probably planning a trip to bali but just remember there is actually a lot more to the country and well, it doesn't still go to bali but go to bali appreciate bali there is a lot there but remember there's a lot more to the whole mm. country and it doesn't take long to get to other parts and a lot of the time when you're flying in you might not fly into bali you might actually fly into java and Java's got absolutely amazing things to do there. One of the top creators that I've followed that I really like, who's done a lot of content on Indonesia and has actually lived in Bali, uh, is Lost LeBlanc. And I recommend you checking out his channel. So he is link in the description. And he's actually lived in Bali for a little bit during the lockdown. Yeah. Which I thought was quite interesting. I think quite a few people have tried to move out there. And I've even watched recently a lot of YouTube videos on people who have moved out there expecting one thing, have still loved it, but have realized just this whole image of Indonesia and the Bali mm -hmm. and the Java life is very different online as it is into reality. And I would say it's one of the safer countries that I've been to in terms of traveling and feeling like I'm not being targeted. I've seen so many groups of girls just traveling on their own being completely fine and completely safe whereas there are other countries i'd 100 percent not recommend going just as a group of girls yeah yeah very much so if you think you're going to indonesia really you're just going for bali because you're trying to find yourself the key is to finding yourself get a selfie at the yoga barn because that is like the gut PR central of finding yourself. And when you leave college and you're about to go to university, so to find yourself, go to the Pura Tita Embu Temple. I'm not trying to disrespect the Indonesians because it's like these university like gut PR students. It's like where you like cleanse your soul. Next thing is to make sure you get as many waterfall photos for the gram as possible because you can't find yourself if you don't gram at least like minimum of twice a day, 10 times on your story, just showing like how healthy your breakfast is, like how perfectly circular it is in the bowl with like all your fruit around the side. And if you didn't know, Eminem actually like predicted the gut PR because he did a thing called like lose yourself. And realistically, it's actually about like not losing yourself once you've come back from Bali. So he talks about spaghetti and what he actually meant to say was like me goreng. So like the me goreng is like, instead of your mom's spaghetti, it's like the Indonesian thing. But the main thing to not lose yourself and keep yourself in the sort of grand Bali zone is make sure you scroll down this page, you click like, you click subscribe, you ring that notification bell. And remember, when you come back from Indonesia and you go to a headhunting island called Sumba, you bring back a machete, because this machete is what I've killed Morgan with. That's why he's no longer here. Like, subscribe, ring that notification bell, leave a review if you're listening on a podcast. And Morgan, I haven't lost myself, but I seem to have lost like... Where's our outro? Why did I jump? Roll the outro. Oh, my hamstring. Let's make it happen. I hope that you can handle uh, going on adventures. Best kept secret travels. Yeah, all over the globe. Having fun, you know the deal. Amazing secret locations. Hang out with Morgan and Will. Uh, educate and entertain. Haggle in the market. Uh, sharing their experiences. Time to get it started. Let's go.